Today I would like for you to join with me as we turn our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to read all of chapter 8, all 20 verses. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that fifth book of the Bible. Beginning with verse 1 of chapter 8. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land Yahweh promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how Yahweh your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so Yahweh your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of Yahweh your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For Yahweh your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise Yahweh your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget Yahweh your God failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiply, multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget Yahweh your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, My power and strength and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, as it is today. If you ever forget Yahweh your God, and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations Yahweh destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying Yahweh your God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the blessing of this day. We thank you for your word, which you have carefully preserved for us throughout the millennia, and that allows us to know you better, to know uh, the love and the mercy and the grace that you show each of us every single day. We thank you for these blessings. We thank you for the blessing of your son Jesus and the life that we have through him. And we thank you for this time to praise you and to honor you in our words and in our actions, our thoughts, as we go forward from today. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this section starts out by saying, Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today. Now taken on its own, it just sounds like God is bossing us around, telling us what to do. And unfortunately, that is how many take this verse. Look at what else it says, though. So that you may live and increase, and may enter and possess the land Yahweh promised. This is talking about life and increase, to prosper in all that they do for the Lord. And it talks about the promised land, in which verses 6 through 9 describe it quite a bit, and it sounds absolutely idyllic. There's abundant water, there's a variety of crops to produce, and the resources are plentiful. This is what God promised for the Israelites' obedience to his word. And it tells us to remember, to not forget that God led you through the desert. From the, their path of, of slavery in Egypt to the promised land that God was taking them to should have taken two to three weeks at most. Yet they wandered for 40 years. 
They wandered for 40 years because of their faithfulness. Because no sooner had they witnessed the miracles of God. Think about what the Israelites had witnessed. They witnessed the plagues that God visited upon all of Egypt. He witnessed these great miracles, these great and terrible miracles. They witnessed them. They witnessed God's presence before them and behind them as they traveled out of Egypt in the form of a cloud of, of a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. They witnessed all of this, all these miracles, this power of God present among them. They witnessed the miracle of the seas being parted and their ability to traverse the, the seabed on dry land. And Pharaoh's army being swallowed up by the waters. They witnessed all of this. And here they are. No sooner had they seen all this, they're in the presence of God. They're at the base of the mountain. Moses on the top of the mountain. The mountain is engulfed in power and glory and majesty. They can even hear God's voice booming from the mountaintop. And yet, they turn from God. And they ask Aaron to fashion for them gods that they can handle. Gods that they can deal with. Because of their rebelliousness, God kept them from their destination, from their reward, if you will. Because this was a generation that was undeserving of such a reward. And yet we see that God still provided. It says that their clothes never wore out. God's protection over his children. It says that their feet did not swell from the constant wandering. God provides comfort, even to his undeserving children. And of course, there's the quail, water, and manna that filled the hunger and thirst that they had. But God alludes to here a, a greater, a deeper and, and greater hunger and thirst that only God could satisfy. And Jesus, millennia later, also points this out. Now we see it provided by God. We see manna provided by God. But we ultimately see the word of God that is provided by God himself that gives us the greatest fullness. The Israelites were made to wander in order to know their own hearts, their hearts, in order to know their hearts and not for God to know their hearts because he already knew what was in their hearts. Just as he knows which is in, what is in each of our hearts already. But they needed to know for themselves. The testing that God puts all men through is to expose our intentions and our motivations. Not to he who, who already knows all. And not for the world to see. It is for each individual to see. To come face to face with the truth of their own hearts so that there can be no reasonable deniability. This kind of testing can be a great blessing if we accept it as such. For it can help us to draw closer to God, to deepen our knowledge and love of Him. It can help us to understand what is truly in our heart, what is affecting our heart, what is affecting our relationship with God, what's keeping us from that relationship, what is straining that relationship. That testing helps us to grow closer to God. In verse 10, I, I love this because we, we generally praise God for the bounty of our, of our table uh, before meals. But here in verse 10, it reminds us to lift our praises when we have been satisfied. To praise God for the meal itself, but even more so for the fullness of the satisfaction that it provides. And the same ideology carries over to God's word. He has given us his word. and We ought to glorify his name for this blessing. And it is his word that fills us with love, compassion, and hope. His word satisfies as nothing else can. And so we praise God for the, the blessing of his word. But as we consume it, as we make it a part of our lives, as we eat it into our lives and make it a part of us, then it fills us. We ought to praise God even more so. So praise God. And be careful that you do not forget Yahweh your God, as it says here. Once again, a reminder of who all honor and glory belongs. Verses 11 through 16 point out how his people have and will continue to be blessed. They, are, they have been blessed and they continue to be blessed. We, as his children, we've come to God through Jesus and the waters of baptism continue 
to be blessed. And so to forget, we become successful in different ways, different areas of our lives. But to forget God in these successes of life can lead to an inflated sense of self. And one might focus too much upon their own efforts. Forgetting that it is by the will of God that we do anything at all. He blesses us in all that we have and all that we're able to do. And we must never forget this. To forget is to dismiss just how much God blesses and provides for us daily. And from my understanding of who God is, and, and his word has provided a pretty clear picture of who he is, it tells us about his heart. It tells us about how much he loves and cares for us. But, but I get the picture that he does not like to be dismissed. Who would? Because while he promises blessings for those who follow in his ways, he makes another promise. He makes a promise to those who do not. God has sworn time and again that those who deny him will be destroyed. And we've seen this, the literal destruction, fire raining down upon people to be destroyed. We have seen his people themselves, the Israelites, being the instrument of that destruction on those who deny him, those who are ungodly. But we've also seen it as, as most particularly with his people themselves, with the Israelites and with, with Christianity. We've seen it as the removing of his blessings. And it's materialized many times throughout history. We've seen it with the Israelites in the desert. His blessings have been removed from them. Uh, we've seen it throughout history. Whenever his people have turned from him, he has removed his blessings from the people. And really, that's all he needs to do. God doesn't have to rain down fire. He doesn't have to, to display his power in mighty and grandest ways in order to uh, discipline, as it says here in these verses, as to discipline his children for their disobedience. He simply has to remove his blessings. Because think about this. We are in a sinful, fallen world that is full of greed and hatred and anger. And so when God pulls those blessings from his people, he exposes them to the harsh world around them. They are fully at the mercy. And he did this to the people in the, in the desert and throughout history. And so when he removes his, his, his protection, he, he exposes them. And then they ultimately end up suffering at the hands of their enemies. Now, of course, he, he does provide in a variety of ways. He, he protected, we already mentioned that, he, he protected his people in the desert by providing for them food and water, providing for making sure that their clothes never wore out, their feet never swelled. Uh, those that have been captured, he, he, he does not allow them to, to remain captive forever. And he always maintains a remnant. He maintains his people in some way. He continues to protect them. He continues to watch over them. He makes them vulnerable. But he never allows them to be completely destroyed. God, whenever, whenever he has pulled his protection from them, he's still with them. Because he loves his children. He always has and he always will. And so he does not allow them to suffer endlessly. And he does not allow them to suffer unjustly. And so even in their suffering, even in these times of trouble, he is continually providing the strength and comfort to endure. Now this past year, it may make us think that, that maybe God has removed his protection from his people once again. And it certainly felt like that from time to time. It's felt like God has removed his protection from his people. He has exposed us to the world that we are in and in We've been dealing with illness and death and loneliness and depression and, and so many other things, right? But these are all the unfortunate realities of this fallen world. And I don't think that God has removed his protection from his people. I think that the, the effects are just becoming more and more pronounced as fewer people are in relationship with God. There are more people on earth than there ever have been. But there are fewer people that are in a relationship with God, that are in true relationship with God. This means a great increase in wickedness. 
This in turn results in godly facing greater suffering among the ungodly. Now scripture tells us that the last days will be like the days of Noah. That men will revel in their wickedness. And through wickedness will come suffering. Suffering that affects everyone. Godly and ungodly alike. And it doesn't seem fair, right? It, it hardly seems fair. Why, why should a godly person have to suffer right along the ungodly for their choices? We're all connected. It's all about relationships. It always comes back to relationships. So we're always being affected by these things. And it doesn't seem fair. But of course, if life was fair, if it was truly fair, we would receive the full wages of sin, the first, and I assure you, it would be the only time that we sin. But God is merciful. He has been merciful throughout time. And as such, he has delayed the sentence for our sins. And in the interim, God provides protection and comfort. He gives us hope. He is with us. He's always been with us. He's never forsaken us. He never leaves us. He never forgets us. Throughout the millennia, despite our stubbornness and our rebelliousness, God has remained faithful. God has remained faithful to us. You know, we talk about examples in our lives of, of people of faith and their faithfulness. And we, we look at scripture, and of course Hebrews, the faith chapter, it talks about those who are faithful. But yet God's faithfulness to us is far greater than any example we have ever known and that we ever could know. Because he is faithful to us, though we have made no promise to him. He's made us plenty of promises, and he asks us to be faithful to him. Yet, he remains faithful to us, though we do not promise anything to him. He is constantly here with us. Do we not owe it to him to at least try to be faithful to him, to try to be in his word, to try to develop and grow and strengthen that relationship with him? That, that's, that's, that's what he wants. Should we not do our best to not forget the Lord? Because he doesn't forget us. He never has. We struggle each and every day. And we're in the midst of, of hard times and we're coming into a new year. We're, we're moving into a new year. We're starting to move forward, hoping to put the old behind. But ultimately, when you talk about the old, the ultimate of old is the original God. We can't put him behind. We cannot forget him. Too often in our, in our lives, whether it's in our troubles or, or our successes, we tend to do just that, don't we? We are no different, no better ultimately, than the Israelites and their rebellious sin. And from time to time, we do forget our God. We do forget his faithfulness. So this is just a reminder for all of us, everyone within the sound of my voice today, to remember God, to remember his faithfulness, the love that he has for us, and that he has never wavered from that. I hope you're able to join us next week as we continue reading in Deuteronomy and, and studying God's word. For, the today, for today, though, for the days ahead, we leave you with this prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, you have been faithful to us. You continue to love us as undeserving children, to guide us and encourage us, to strengthen us, to provide for us in, in ways that we often take for granted, that we often miss and misunderstand. But Lord, we, we pray that this day and every day forward that we are cognizant of your blessings, that we are cognizant of your presence and aware uh, of just how mightily you pray, you, you bless us and, and that we are praising you for that each and every day. Lord, we, we love you. We just thank you for your faithfulness to us. 
we thank you for your faithfulness to us that puts you through the ultimate pain of watching your son suffer for us. You've endured so much over all these years. Lord, there is nothing we can say to make up for that except that we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.